Zaid. I believe Zaid asked this question at the very, very end of last week's webinar. Right as I was hitting the end button, I saw it come through, so I completely missed it. And um, I'm not going to go too in-depth to this, but Zaid does ask, what is your favorite strategy for earnings? Can you please show us an example? Well, typically what we've been doing and what Ernie's been testing, and Ernie's working on um, a, a uh, I don't want to say this, a product for, for lack of a better term, but, but a concept, a full concept of trading it and managing it is doing shorter term straddles with earnings coming up in a few short days. So here's the example. This isn't the exact search he's using, but this is something I created to see uh, how it works over time. And I was, I was doing this four years ago, Zaid, and I traded it for about two and a half years and then I tried something else, then I went back to this for another six to eight month period and had good success with it. So, uh, this I don't even know this stock, but MVC, this isn't a, this isn't a recommendation or suggestion. MVC trading at nine, oh, let's not take MVC, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. We'll take Washington Federal, WAFD. And WFD is trading at 35.29, and we're shown that we could buy a January 40 called 40 put, same strike, same expiration for January 17th, with earnings coming out on 114. All right, so the midpoint cost of this is $4.43. Right, let's take a look at the profit and loss run. Long straddle, buying a call and a put, exact same strike price, okay, your V profit and loss chart. Now, I'm not just taking the top one from the results, Saeed. What I'm looking at here is here's a result that came up. I didn't use the first one that I started looking at, that lower price stock. Not because it wasn't lower strike. I'm sorry, not because it was lower price. Because of that. Unconfirmed. I can't guarantee that the earnings come out. I'm looking for the ones that are confirmed and after the close uh, or before the open. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. But I'm looking for the confirmed ones. I'm looking for ones that say confirmed. I didn't choose the second one because it's a $3 stock. Not to say it couldn't move that much, but I didn't like the five strike in this case. So I took Washington, I'm just taking an example of Washington Federal. I want to see that confirmed there in the earnings date column, which you can select to view at any time. I want the CONF. I don't want the UN CONF. I want to make sure that the earnings are coming out and confirmed between now and expiration. So today I might have bought Washington Federal, paid 4.43 for the 40 strike call, and the 40 strike put for January 17th expiration with earnings coming out on the 14th. There's my profit and loss chart on the position. What do I know? I need about an eight point movement up and a yeah, smaller movement down just because it's, I probably would do the 35, not the 40s here in this case, but for some reason that's what came up. I might have been on a default search site, I'm sorry. Um, let's take a look, let's do that. Let's go to the 35s instead. It'll almost be the same cost in this case. I can almost guarantee it. It's going to be about 450 or so. So I want to do the 35, 35. Wow, it's much less than I thought. Okay. All right, so let's, that looks better. Let's do that. I have something in that search that was pushing it further to the bullish skew side. There we go. That's better. Okay. So what am I expecting? I'm expecting a movement definitely above 36.05 or below 33. What do I know is going to happen to these options? Well, I know I'm going to experience a volatility crush. Okay, what does that mean? Well, these options probably have a relatively high volatility. These ones don't, but a lot of options where earnings are coming up will have a higher IV. Going back to Paul's point, hey, shouldn't we be selling IV? No, even if I have a very high IV, I don't want to be doing a short straddle or short strangle going into earnings. It's just too much risk. It really is. Even though you're getting that higher premium, extending the upper and lower break even to further away where the things could expire in your favor, when you hit that one that hits an unexpected shift very fast, 33, 35% down, 20, 25% up, you're taking an immense loss and an immense margin required to do it because you're in a naked call and a naked put. So we look to buy. And if the swing occurs as we want, shorter term trades, earning I believe actually looks 10 days before the earnings and buys options that are, you know, he's two weeks away from earnings, 10 days away from earnings for the next available expiration after earnings. That's what his search is looking for. He's done much more research than this. That's why he's developing all of this. But that's what I look for. And of course, what could happen? If the earnings come out and the stock does nothing, it stays right at 35, the IV drops, and I may take a 60, 70% loss on this. 
Those two options might drop down to $0.10 cents a piece, be $0.20. Cents. I might lose $0.80 cents of the 105 I entered into the position. So what do I do? Well, I just close it. And this represents doing this. I do it no more than 3 to 5% of my total portfolio because there is that potential that if the earnings don't cause a good movement one way or the other, if the stock just stays, which we see sometimes, it just moves up half a percent or one percent, the volatility crush will occur and you'll take near a 70, 80 percent loss on what you invested. Never should be more than three to five percent. This is like lottery ticket stuff, to be honest with you. I'm taking a chance, saying, hey, if it swings, great, make a little extra preview. If it doesn't, okay, I can still stomach that loss. I'll make it back with some of the income methods from the married put strategy or my bull put credit spreads. Simple as that. So without going too in-depth into it, Zaid, that's the basic structure of what we look for. Ernie's got much more detail on this. It's developing for those other write-ups and that other product, uh, which will be available uh, in the next month or so as well. All right, so th th this is a very strong question. And Eric says, but so you're saying that the married puts radioactive trades beat credit spreads and iron condors over the long term. If so, I would... I would agree because the risk reward is so skewed against us for credit spreads uh, despite the high probability. And that's right. And, um, but again, it depends on which trades you do. Okay? So going back, and I know I'm using a broad market indicator and we'd be using different stocks uh, for that and, and different things of that nature, Eric. But I had mentioned I wasn't trading iron condors during these time periods. I will admit freely, without a doubt, no question that it was about this now. Yeah, yeah, it was right about here. I think I started trading and developing more of the bull put credit spreads that I mentioned on the webinars that I do with 15% of my portfolio. This time period here, the bull puts did outperform, the bull put portion of my portfolio did outperform the married puts, absolutely. This time frame, if I had continued trading bull puts from here to here, uh, it wouldn't even be a question. The married puts were profitable. The bull puts were profitable by only 10%, 10% of what I, what I started with at the beginning of the year. Okay? And that's when for your expectation should be 35, 40%. It was at 10%. Now, the married puts, even with this decline in trading through them, were profitable. Bull puts better here, married puts better here, bull puts better here, but both were pretty much about even. But it's also a skewed thing, isn't it? Because you expect that leverage return, but when you get a hiccup, as I had mentioned, let's go back to three-year chart, two-year chart in this case. The only thing that saved my bull put credit spread portfolio at all, and I shouldn't even count it this way, but I do because it's part of my trading, Eric. When this happened, this took out 49, no, I, think about the, I have to think about the number very quickly here, is 48.5% that February 5th, 2018 to February 9th collapse, right? That like, sort of volatility crush, uh, uh, the events that global events are going on at that time, that sudden drop down in price, minus 48.5% from where I started at the beginning of the year. One position I closed out was down 64%, one was down 25%, and the other was down 62% when I closed them. And that means of the max loss, but I was fully invested with 15% of my portfolio. What did that minus 48.5% do? Wiped out everything from here forward, okay? That was gone. That's now gone. Those profits are gone. But as a precaution, I also take a small portion of my portfolio into VIX calls to hedge the bull put or diagonal spreads, which can lose 50 to 60%. I don't have to worry about hedging my married put positions. I have to worry about hedging my bull puts. So the VIX calls shot up. The gain I took on the VIX calls countered that loss and actually gave me a profit. So if I lump them together, that helped the 10%. If I took the VIX calls out of this equation from what I just showed you, remember how I said that in this time period here, the bull puts absolutely destroyed the married puts as far as return for investment goes in my portfolio. You factor in this, which took out all of this, 
because of the risk reward ratio you're talking about. Yes, I want that probability of 85%, which puts me to 8 to 1, 9 to 1 risk reward ratio. But wiping out that 48.5, uh, 48.7% of my total portfolio that I had allocated to bull puts with that one event, February 5th through 9th, that wiped out all of this. So what does that mean? The married puts actually did better than the bull put credit spreads over that time period because of that event. But if I stopped it, January 30th of 2018, completely owned by bull put credit spreads in that situation. Not, and I tried to do testing that time period with iron condors. We had some comments on the Friday discussions about iron condors. They actually didn't look so well. The bear calls, even going 90% probability above, you were still adjusting them in some of these situations. You weren't getting ahead. And if you're in an iron condor in standard stocks, you're probably closing those bear calls often, trying to roll them, trying to manage them, and you weren't getting ahead. So depending on which time frame you look at, and yes, now if I look at four years back, the bull puts are higher than the married puts. So why don't I do 50% of my portfolio in bull puts, only 15 in married puts? Because the bull puts see 48, 58, 52% declines when a sudden event happens where I'm down 2.5%, 3% in my married put portfolio. So when you look at the time frames, yeah, so I would say that actually the bull puts have done better. Just, this is just the four-year cycle. But when you look at it overall, when you take a little, you take a little slice and you can say, oh, yeah, you would have dominated here in bull puts. And I did. I did well in married puts here too. A month later, I'm down on the bull puts. I'm still kind of up on the married puts even with this truncation there. So it depends on the time frame you look at. Oh, oh, so Chuck, okay, this is a follow-up to the bull puts we were just talking about and, and the, the positions there. Um, I'm sorry, no, this was about the earnings. Chuck says, did you enter limit orders to take a profit when the earnings are announced? Not necessarily. Uh, I know you're in a different situation uh, there as well. Um, you know, uh, Chuck's, Chuck's over there, um, uh, New Zealand, I believe, and um, kind of puts in his day orders there and does that. But so I did not... Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't uh, think about that for a second, okay? All right, sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling through some of the lists at this. Give me a second here, okay? So no, the answer to your question, Chuck, while I'm looking at some of these others is no, I don't use a stop uh, in that case. I don't use a limit order to close out of the positions. I watch what the market does after the open, and then what I may do is if it's, let's say it's down, I may just sell the call for what I can get and leave the put open if it continues down as well. Okay, uh, I may do it in that scenario and so to, to try to get more on the other side, okay? And, and then look at it to go from there um, or reverse on the other side. So, but I don't use a stop per se. Um, usually just closing them on my own. Ernie usually closes it on his own as well after the earnings open. Okay, this is a question that um, Ed asks. It's a great question. It was uh, from earlier. I think it got caught up in, in, I'm sorry, Ed, it got rearranged, but it was during the bull put. It was before the bull put conversation, actually. Ed says, on a bull put credit spreads, more often than not, I initially lose on an 80% probability trade. How can I use IV to search other criteria to avoid immediate loss? I, I can say, do what I do. Go to 85%. Forget 80, go to 85. Seriously, it makes a difference. Number two, don't look for the highest return trade. Don't look for the highest volatility trade. Okay? Go for an 85% probability and still look for stocks. Look for the same stock criteria, Ed, in a bull put credit spread that you would use to buy shares of stock. Now, this has been a tough market. There have been some, let's go to back to six months here for just SPY. As good as the market has been in the last three months, it's also been kind of tenuous, hasn't it? And what do I mean by that? I mean, we're, we're up, you know, if we take the low end 285 to 325, you know, that's, we saw 19% gains, right? We saw 19% run almost, it seems like. Uh, 15, 19% run from the very low to the very top here. But again, if I started trading bull puts here, this was a tenuous time and even at 85% probably I might have been threatened. Should have done okay here with 85 and then we're good. This might have been questionable, depending if I opened here, or even if I opened right here, that might have been a threat. Then we're good, good, good. This even might have threatened an 85 unlikely, and then we've been good, 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 good. I stick at 85% probability, but you know what I look for in that case, Ed? The stock criteria I'm looking for, 
I don't want something that has an 85% probability but has an extremely high implied volatility. I don't want to see that. I'm looking for the same exact stock criteria, underlying criteria I would use if I was planning to buy the stock right now and hold it for 60, 90, 120 day period. I want to see stocks in an uptrend above the, following the trend above the 20 day or above the 50 day moving average. I want good average stock volume. I want good market cap, mid cap to higher. I don't want to look for small cap stocks. I don't want to look for fly by nights just because they have a good premium, even if that 85% probability is there. I want to see a positive MACD. I want to see uh, stocks near the upper range of their upper Bollinger Band. And um, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for stocks that are kind of following this pattern here. And it may sound boring. You may come across a Boeing. You may come across a Netflix. You know, that's a bad example, but you may, you know, you may come across something that's lower volatility and you say, oh, well, it's only an 11, 10% return. Back to the same conversation we just had about the iron condors to me apply to the bull put. And why am I focusing on this idea that you need to look for the same exact criteria you would if you were buying a stock and going to hold it for a three, four, five month period? Because remember, that is a potential outcome of the bull put credit spread. Your obligations do not change. If I'm looking at SPY right now and I sell the 320 and let's say I buy the 315 for February, not a recommendation or suggestion. But if that, if I do that, and I don't watch it, and then I turn it on on expiration day of February to see what's going on, and the stock's at 317, what happens? I'm forced to buy shares of stock at SPY at 320. My cost basis is 320 minus that net credit we took in for this 43, 42-day out bull put spread. Not saying that's what you're doing, um, but it would be there as well, okay? Because that is a potential outcome. It doesn't, just because you're in a spread, it doesn't change the obligation you have here to potentially buy shares of stock at that price. You want to follow the trend. That's why it's called a bull put credit spread. It's bullish. It should only be done on neutral to bullish stocks. Now, I am the reason why I say that 85% is I've been showing on different webinars. We've gone back and done testing. Um, somewhere close to an 89%, 80, yeah, 89% success rate over this year with bull put credit spreads following that 85% probability and uh, doing those positions in that portion of my portfolio, that 10, 15% of my portfolio as well. Um, so, and I've shown examples where using the trade simulator tool where we put in the numbers that we'd see or we'd expect with an 80% probability and you actually need it to be right 80, 81% of the time. But looking for an 85% probability, I actually can have a successful trading record being right 83% of the time. That's where my targets are, and that's what I'm looking to do. Edison, this is a tough question. We reviewed this uh, a couple weeks ago. Can't remember which webinar it was, but let's go back to Washington Federal. And we'll go to our profit and loss chart that we were discussing a little bit there for the, um, the earning straddles. It's an interesting question. I think it was asked a, a couple weeks ago, and I, we covered it, and I'll have to try to find that one for you. But Edison's question was, can we sell wings on those just making sure the wings are wide enough? I wouldn't do it. Okay, here's the reason why. We're talking about a position here that's a lottery card. This one looks not too bad. You know, 440, uh, we, we, I'm sorry, we were at the 35. Let me go back to the 35. This wasn't the, um, this wasn't the right strike prices to use, Edison. We want it to be at 35. There we go. This looks like a very low risk, and it is. Kind of straddle on a position. But I'd have to go back and see, does WAFD even move at earnings? Is there expectation for two or three point move one direction or the other during an earnings to where this could be a reasonable profit to what I want? Sometimes this is just on the boards when you see a normal and a higher implied volatility and a higher cost. I think earnings success rate is only about 52, 53%. So why does he still bother doing it? Well, there's so many other things out there that have a higher percentage. Because on those ones, 10 percent, so maybe 5 percent of these and 5 percent here, you're getting the swing that you didn't expect, 28, 30, 35 percent swing in the stock one direction or the other, which can be a 400, 500 percent return. So that's maybe, that's maybe 5 percent of the time total. Now it's probably five each side, about 10 percent of the time. You're seeing 300, 400, 500 percent gains on these calls. And then about maybe 15 to 20% of the time, you're seeing 100, 100 to 50% gains on these positions. 
me. So we've got 10 and you got about 15. So that's about 25% of the time. And maybe about 30% of the time you're in here. 20, 30, 40% gains maybe. Okay, so that's maybe about 20% of the time. So we're 10, 20, 25, so we're at 45. So almost 60%, about 50, yeah, 55% of the time. 55% of the winners, 5% are up here. 5 to 10% are up here. 10 to 15% are here. 20 to 25% are in here. Okay? And then you have the other 50% that are in this range, which is really a quick peak. You know, it could be 60, 70% loss, could be an 80% loss, maybe a 40% loss 5% of the time, but it's really steep down here. Okay? That's, there's really a lot of them that are in that range. When they lose, that's why. And sometimes you even see a big gap up of 7 or 8%, but if you paid into too much implied volatility, you're not even profitable. Your loss of maybe 30%, 20% of what you paid in. Okay? All of that being said, this is why we never try to lower the cost, to lower the risk by selling the wings on the outside because I, still, I don't want to cap those 5% of the time where I see maybe a 300, 400% gain or more to a 40% gain. All right? Because that's not going to increase my winners, is it? No, that's going to take out the higher range of the winners. I'm still going to have almost the same success rate. It's just I capped the higher ends. I capped the biggest winners to only 40% gains. Should be all be so lucky. But then it's up here. You say, oh, yeah, but you lowered the risk by generating the premium here. So you, when you lose, you don't lose as much. Yes, but I'm still probably losing 50% of the time, 45% of the time. And so I lowered that. What have I not done? I haven't increased the win ratio, and I've taken the winners off the top more than I've reduced the losers at the bottom. And still, the ratio is the same. So this is all stuff that Ernie's going through. He's the better person to ask for that when he gets a chance and when he gets all of his analysis done. But this is all the analysis going through for, I don't know, a year and a half now. That's what we do. <laughs> you know, it's, sometimes we tell you about these products that are coming out, but you don't see them for a while. Why? Because we're running every possible scenario we can think of from any question that we could think that would come in or does come in. Is it better if Ernie sold these? Is it better if he just did strangles for lower cost than straddles? Is it better if he did them 10 days out versus 5 days out? He's literally researched, is it better if he opens in the morning as opposed to opening in the afternoon when he decides which day is the best? It's like, is it better to open five days away, six days away, seven days away, 17 days away, two days away? He's going through all of that with exhaustive testing and results and seeing how they perform. So anyway, long story short, that's something that he has looked at and that's the problem. You sell on those wings. You do lower the risk. You're absolutely right. You may even increase the upper to lower break even a little bit in your favorable direction. But you miss out now on those big gains that you might get 5 to 10% of the time, which really are the basis for countering the 50% of the time. You take a 60, 70, 80% loss because of implied volatility collapse and it just doesn't move. I wouldn't suggest that at all. I'm going to have to look this up for you. Nelson, um, he, he is, we're at uh, 5.45 here, but Nelson says, can you talk about the VIX calls a little bit more? Well, it's just a hedge, and I usually use about 1% or 2% of my portfolio. And I'll typically look to buy VIX when it's below, and this, this might be the new range here, but usually below 12. Um, 12.50 is probably not a bad time. But I'll buy an out-of-the-money VIX call or calls small percent of my portfolio maybe yeah maybe about two percent is more accurate depends on the the time frame but about two percent's right um and i'll buy out of the money calls just 45 days maybe 50 days out of time trying to cross two cycles especially now earnings aren't as important because it has to be a big move for this to go um and so I try to only pay a dollar per contract. So normally I like to buy, if the VIX is at 11, I'll probably eyeball the 16 strikes. Hopefully they're around a dollar. Uh, right now on the VIX calls with it 12.56, the 16s are probably a little expensive. So I might be going to the 17s. And I don't know if that's a, it's a good uh, value right now, even though if they're at a dollar or less. But yeah, I'm putting in a set amount. So I'm probably buying four, five, six contracts at a time. And that's it. And then if an event happens and the spike occurs, then absolutely, I'll probably take the profit right away or at least sell half of them. I don't want to try to time it. I'll say, ooh, the, there was an event that came out, another missile got fired into something, and the VIX suddenly shoots up to 19, and I've got a 95% gain on my VIX calls. 
Well, I might sell half at that point because that's probably helping hedge some other things I'm worried about that are nearing the stop, Nelson. But what I'm not going to do is say, okay, if I see it go up the next day, and then the next day it's probably more slow, but then I might get out of it altogether. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm going to hold it till it keeps going up. No, because if you look at the chart on the VIX, I might as well do that while I'm here. Sorry about that, Nelson. Probably be the smartest thing to do in this case. Oops. There we go. Yeah, so this spike was not as high as a profit as I would have wanted. Um, so I had at this time, oh no, I'm in the wrong time. That's the January one. I'm talking about, I'm thinking of the December one. The December one here, that was the better one. There was a profit there, but see, here's what you have to be careful with. Once you get to a peak, and once you see that first jump, that's when you at least want to sell half or maybe more. Why? Because two days later, it's back down to where it was. It comes down so fast. You've got to catch that move. And this wasn't even a move, by the way, that's big enough to be really profitable for it to make any sense in that case. What you're more looking for, and not looking for, what you're protecting against, I should say, you're, what you're protecting your portfolio against. And Sam uses shares of UVXY, which is something you could look into as well. Let's see, that last big gap up August, the first couple days of August, so here I did have, and that's the other thing, you got it. Well, I'm not going to get into it now, Nelson, we don't have the time, but there's so much more involved with the, the VIX calls, meaning that the expirations are on Wednesday, okay? Um, never, huh, I don't want to say that. Your VIX calls don't necessarily have intrinsic value. I'll say that because it's not based on a security. It's based on futures pricing derivatives of volatility. So what does that mean? That means if I bought the 16 calls for August here when the VIX was around 11 and I paid a dollar for each one, when it peaked it here at 25, these weren't necessarily worth $9 per contract. My 16 strikes weren't necessarily worth $9. They could have been worth a lot more. But it doesn't necessarily have to be an intrinsic value that you're used to with other options because it's not based on this set security and price. It's based on future projections and derivative of that in time, not right now. That's sort of the confusing part. Um, so that's what you have to take into account. But what I'm looking for here is just, hey, I'm in bull puts. Look at what happened August 1st. You know, you saw that decline again. It was August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The VIX shot up. So yeah, I, sold, I think I sold... I think I had, no, Sam might be able to refresh my memory. I remember we were talking about this on a webinar. I think I had seven calls and I sold five uh, is what happened at that time. I think I only had seven calls, put about $700 in, and I think I sold five of them here and left two open, and then I closed them again here. Um, and then I waited. And I don't think I bought new VIX calls here. I waited, yeah, it was down here. I didn't go back in until September. And then I bought some more down in this range. But no, I don't do the opposite. Someone just asked, do you do the opposite? After the spike, do you buy the puts? No, I, I don't. Uh, why? Because the puts are too expensive. <laughs> so right here, when the stock shot up to 25, I'm sorry, when the VIX shot up to 24, 25, at this point, those 16 calls, they were worth a good value. Now, they might not have been intrinsic because that's not how the VIX works. But at the same time, looking to buy, let's say, a out of the money put at 20, 19 or 18, those are all four, five and six dollars. <laughs> so it's, it's hard it's hard to play this other direction because the puts are so expensive in that situation. Um, so that's uh, that's not what we look for there. I, I don't do it the opposite end after the big move there. I just use the calls and I just use that to hedge my portfolio in that situation. All right, so that's that's it. But there's a lot more involved in that because the VIX is not based on something and I don't pretend to even say that I do a lot of management on the VIX uh, at all. This is really just a insurance, it's an extra insurance policy, right? And sometimes it doesn't work out. This one, oh yeah, let's look at it and be honest. These ones I said I bought here did not work out. I sold a few when it went up here, but it wasn't really a great profit, held the others, and they're going to be worthless, right? They're going to, yeah, next Wednesday, they're going to go bye-bye. They're probably worth about 20 cents right now, 10 cents. I can't remember which one. I get a sudden event next week, Monday or Tuesday. I don't want to see it. But if there's a sudden event and the market turns and this spikes up to 19, I'm going to be looking pretty good on those remaining VIX calls I have. But this cycle here, Nelson, is not profitable 
but everything else I was doing in my portfolio was. <laughs> the bull puts, the new married puts I had just opened at the end of December and so forth. So again, that that's not, the married puts are just there to mention. I'm not using the VIX calls in any relation. Those, those are used to hedge iron condor portion if I was doing that. Bull put credit spreads, which I am doing. Diagonal spreads so that when the unexpected happens, the loss I take on those spreads is hedged by the gains I have in the fixed calls. All right, but again, I'm only doing you know like two percent of the portfolio, two percent of the capital invested into that extra hedge. But the bull puts themselves. That's only ten or fifteen percent of my portfolio, where each position doesn't represent more than five percent. I only have about maybe three or four bull puts open at a time. Uh, in that case, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen. That was a spirited conversation. That was a lot of fun. Um, we covered a lot of information there from uh, Paul, of course, about the um, the first half hour there, the question via email and some of the testing results. And we got into some good conversations about the, the married put structure and also the uh, hedging of the different strategies in addition to that. And we got some good conversation in there uh, related to the VIX just now, as well as many of the other topics. But I do want to remind everyone that today's material are my thoughts on your questions designed for educational purposes, increasing investing knowledge and options performance. Any stocks or options discussed today should not be taken as direct trading suggestions. I'm not going to open an iron condor on Roku or on DIA, SPY, or QQQ from the beginning of our conversation. Um, we looked at some of those other straddles that we were talking about on WAFD for earnings. I'm not opening that one next week as well. Um, in that case, uh, any stocks or options discussed, yeah, they're not direct recommendations. Options involve risk may not be suitable for all investors. One of the main things you heard me just wrap up with and talk about is position sizing. Anytime you do any of these leverage strategies that can lose 100% credit spreads, iron condors, diagonals, even those long straddles, they should only be done with a smaller portion of your portfolio, 3, 4, 5% at the most. So if you do take that 100% loss from the unexpected in that position, you've only taken out 4 or 5% of your portfolio. That's proper position sizing. That's probably the most important key to controlling risk in the positions. Not a higher delta, not a higher probability, not looking for lower IV. We're doing a spread or anything of that kind. We're doing it with only a smaller portion of our portfolio. You guys aren't seeing that because the screen didn't unpause correctly. Hooray. Okay, but that's okay. That was just what I was reading there. For those of you that uh, were just stopping by today, haven't done it before, remember you can take a trial to Power Options at any time. Go to PowerUp.com, just put in your name and email address. You have full access to the site for 14 days. After that, the subscriptions start at $45 per month. Um, and then there's different levels of subscription, if, depending if you want full access to the historical data that goes back uh, around a little bit over 10 years or the real time. So the free education, you can always check it out, blog.powerop.com. Um, you can also go to the webinars page, powerop.com slash webinars.asp. Many of those are public webinars. Some are for subscribers only. And, of course, you can always check us out on YouTube under user power options. Most of those videos are public. Well, if you think of any other questions later on, ladies and gentlemen, you know, just give me a call, send us an email, support at powerop.com, support at radioactivetrading.com, or you can reach us at 302-992-7971. Of course, if you are on your trial or you are a subscriber to Power Options, remember you can schedule one of those coaching sessions at any time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again. Have a fantastic weekend. Um, Sam, uh, reemphasizes the point there that uh, position sizing is key. Position sizing is key to success. And he says, thank you very much. Have a fantastic weekend. You too, Sam. Um, and he also mentioned that XLV from the October chart looks fantastic as well. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, Eric, thank you. And um, John, thank you as well, you guys. Martin, thank you. Have a great weekend. Everyone have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.